Welcome to Miked Up Sustainability Revolution with Al Gore. To start, please welcome Mayor Eric Garcetti. Good afternoon, everybody. And come on, we need a little pickup. Good afternoon, everybody. It is such a treat to be back here at Milken. And welcome to Los Angeles. For those of you who aren't lucky enough to have been born here or smart enough to have moved here yet, we are available, so please keep coming back. We love having the world convene here in this place that is very much the crossroads of the world today, the creative capital of the world, the manufacturing capital of America, a place that can lay claim to being the northern capital of Latin America, western capital of the United States, and eastern capital of the Pacific Rim, a place now that is the third largest municipal economy in the world after Tokyo and New York, and a place where we love what Milken does because it is the embodiment of the innovation, of the collisions, of the future, looking uh, outwards, the way that we come together here in Los Angeles, we believe, is the face of the world today and of this nation tomorrow. And thank you to Milken for all the acceleration you have done year after year, to Mike and the entire uh, board, to everybody who convenes these necessary conversations and catalytic moments, uh, what you have done for progress, for prosperity, and most important for folks like me, for policymaking, to make sure that we can create the world that we imagine and that we need to see in these urgent times. We hope to welcome you back here each year, uh, but over the next decade, Los Angeles has a unique um, gift to be able to prepare for the 2028 Olympics and Paralympic Games, which will come home to the United States for the first time in three decades. And in that moment, we can see also with sustainability, with jobs and equity, with belonging and inclusion, with the ideas that should propel the human race that here in Los Angeles as we get ready to host the world, how we can make this a city that doesn't have to choose between some of the challenges we have, but can bring them together. Here in Los Angeles, we are not an either or city. We are a yes and city. And when it comes to sustainability and the growth of our economy, we have for some time put those two things together. It is here where we saw an 11% reduction in our greenhouse gases in the last year we have measured, 2016, the same year we saw a reduction in our unemployment rate of 11% as well. Here in Los Angeles, where we've accelerated out of recession faster than even the state of California, which has accelerated even faster than the nation, where we have about uh, a 75% uh, um, faster rate of job growth than America at large, we know that these two things are tied together. We know that here, where we're the number one solar city in this nation, that just in the last four years, we've added more jobs to the green sector than we've lost in coal in this country. In fact, here where we have about 1% of the nation's population, we've added as many green jobs, about uh, 30,000 in the last four years, as 60% of the remaining coal jobs in America. When we tie these things together, whether it's in the port of LA, where 43% of the goods that come into this nation come through and fuel jobs in every congressional district in this country, whether it's our airport, which is one of the busiest origination and destination airports in the world, we know that when we tie these things together, we can do right for our world while also doing right for our people. Our clean tech incubator is the strongest in the world, attracting $160 million this past year in venture capital. And we've also made sure that as we do this work, that we are leaving no communities behind, launching things like our electric vehicle car share in our poorest communities, putting veterans to work, installing solar panels here on our rooftops in some of our neediest zip codes, and making sure that we provide opportunities for people to be part of the Green Revolution, regardless of their income um, or their zip code, their ethnicity, or even their age. It is such a pleasure to bring everybody here together. I chair a group called Climate Mayors uh, in the United States. And when our national leadership decided to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords, instead of being upset and curling up in a corner or yelling at the TV, we got on the phone. And to date, 402 cities across America, led by Republican mayors, Democratic mayors, nonpartisan mayors, have said, if they're out, we're in. In 48 states representing 80 million Americans, we now have people who are saying, we understand that connection. And that when we can do something good for our people, we also get the economic benefit that comes with that. You don't have to tell a firefighter in Los Angeles whether climate change is real. 
We lost a firefighter this year, battling the largest fire we ever saw in California history because of the longest drought we've ever faced. We know it is real. You don't have to tell somebody who is working at the Port of LA who has asthma, whose children have higher cancer rates, whether or not pollution is real. So for our own health, we are doing these things, but it is also for the health of the uh, gross municipal product that we have here in Los Angeles that these investments have paid off as well. We have before us a really extraordinary moment and an extraordinary person who's become a dear friend, somebody who inspired me uh, as a young elected official, somebody who has a lot of things that you can say about him. He is an Oscar winner, which is the most prestigious thing in this town. <laughs> he is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, which is perhaps the greatest global honor. But what I love about Al Gore is he's never defined himself by titles or by plaudits. He's been vice president. He's been a senator. He's been a journalist. But these things don't describe who Al Gore is. Who Al Gore is perhaps has imparted to me the most important lesson that it doesn't matter who you are or what your title is, whether you've been recognized for your work or not, that the power that you hold in your hands is every single day where you are, where you work, where you study, where you live, where you pray, where you play. And that if each one of us in this room, and just think about the power that's in this room here today, a room that will never come together again like this, can listen to the most urgent call of our lives and the way that Al Gore has been able to work and plug away at the practical steps to make sure each one of us can be as powerful as he is in changing the world directly around us. It gives me great hope that this world will do the right thing for our planet and for our people. So please welcome our dear friend for a very special presentation, Vice President of the United States, the winner of all those things, but most importantly, our friend Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. I, I really appreciate those kind words. And Eric Garcetti, as many of you who live in this city know, is one of the finest mayors ever, one of the finest and one of the smartest I've ever worked with. And it's really an honor to be introduced by you, Mr. Mayor, and I do treasure our friendship. I'm also uh, honored beyond words that Dr. Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, is going to join me on stage after this slideshow. And Jim just accomplished the near impossible, getting a massive capital increase for the World Bank in a time when nobody thought he could do it. And that's fantastic. And what Jim and his team are doing for renewable energy, sustainability, and helping to solve the climate crisis is truly historic. Uh, and we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about some of those things. I don't know if Mike Milken uh, is here. I was visiting with him in the green room, but I want to thank Mike personally, and I want to thank Mike Cloud and the CEO of the Milken Institute. I've had the honor of speaking here a few times and in Singapore and elsewhere, and really this is a unique global institution now that does so much good. Allow me also to acknowledge uh, uh, my colleagues from Generation Investment Management who are here, Colin LaDuke, one of our founding partners, Renee Beaumont, uh, Lila Preston, and Michelle Wang. Thank you uh, very much uh, for being here as well. I'm going to show you some slides, and I always start with uh, these images of the Earth uh, to kind of set the context. Uh, I'm going to talk about the climate crisis. You'd be surprised if I didn't. Uh, I'm going to talk about the sustainability revolution, which embodies uh, the solutions to the climate crisis. And I'm going to talk about sustainable investing. Uh, now, there, there are only three questions that still have to be addressed on the climate crisis side of this. Uh, must we change? Can we change? Will we change? And some of the evidence I will show you in response to the first question, must we change, is a little bit hard to see and hear, so I give you that warning so you won't get too depressed or sink down because the answers to the second and third question, can we change and will we change, are very optimistic and uplifting. So hang in there. 
but the magnitude of the change that we have to bring about is uh, sufficiently large that it's important to have an appreciation for how much is at stake. And the investor community can play and in many ways is beginning to play the key role in solving this crisis. I think it's apparent to most all of us that we are at a turning point, a moment of transformation. The global economy uh, is being transformed in a very fundamental and uh, historic way. Um, it's adapting to a new set of growth uh, conditions. Demand uh, is changing. Resources are changing. Um, the nature of consumer demand has changed because the wages of middle-income families in all of the rich countries have been stagnant for decades now. That's partly one of the reasons for this wave of populist authoritarianism, and that's not my subject today, but don't get me started on it. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, middle-income wages have stagnated in developed countries. The global middle class has grown enormously and is continuing. So the nature of demand in the global marketplace is radically um, affected. And with urbanization, you know, for most of human history, only 15% of the people lived in cities starting a decade ago, more than half. It's on the way up to 70%. And with the center of gravity shifting to China and the other emerging economies uh, in Asia, obviously the whole shape of the global economy has changed. The center of gravity is different now. And with the digital and network uh, revolution, consumers are able to communicate in real time what they want, what they need. Uh, and uh, Earth Incorporated is in high gear to try to satisfy all those demands. The resources available to us have changed. We uh, have encountered unanticipated problems with the resources that we've relied upon in the past, but we're seeing unexpectedly attractive opportunities that are associated with the new resources that we're beginning uh, to tap into and rely on. So this is all very, uh, very exciting. And at bottom, growth as we have defined it really has to become sustainable growth. Really there's a lot that we could all discuss on this one topic, uh, but we all know that we're moving into a period of sustainable growth because for a century and a half since the first oil well was drilled, we've always kind of assumed that the earth has a, had a limitless capacity for self-renewal, but the way we've defined growth, excluding externalities, positive and negative, excluding depreciation of natural resources, paying no account to the uh, distributional consequences and the rapid rise of inequality. Um, we have, we have seen uh, growth become um, so powerful and, and in some ways having destructive consequences. That old assumption is false. Now, one of the reasons has to do with the nature of the sky. This is a picture from the space station, and I, I, I really think this picture says a lot because I remember as a kid looking up at the sky, and I still see it from the ground as a vast and limitless expanse, but actually it's a very thin shell of atmosphere around the planet. And the, the total number of molecules is way smaller than we might assume. And this is what we're using as an open sewer now for our gaseous waste. We're putting 110 million tons of heat-trapping man-made global warming pollution into that thin shell of atmosphere every 24 hours. Uh, and the sources are many. I'm not going to dwell on these. I'm going to focus on one or two. Uh, but leakage of natural gas is a big deal from the compressors, from the fracking process, from the pipelines, burning of gas, coal, and oil is the major sources I'll show you in a minute. But our management of forests and forest burning and burning of croplands, the beginning of the thaw in the uh, soils of the Arctic releasing methane and CO2 and others. Agriculture is a big deal, particularly industrial agriculture, particularly animal agriculture. But the main source by far is our reliance on fossil fuels for 80% of all the energy that the world uses even today. And you can see after World War II, the 
lines started shooting up, and with globalization, when China joined the WTO in uh, 2001, it started at a higher angle. But a spoiler alert, if you look in the far upper right-hand corner, you see that line flattening out. Three of the last four years, it's stabilized. It was a little uptick last year, but it's probably an anomaly. This is good news, but it's not good enough by a long shot. We need to have a slope on the other side uh, uh, of that, that that goes down. We could have skied a bunny slope if we'd started decades ago. Now we've got to ski a double black diamond. But, but we, can, we can do it. But anyway, must we change? That's the issue uh, first at hand. The cumulative amount of all that man-made global warming pollution now traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs. It's a big planet, but that's an enormous amount of energy every single day. And it's really adding up uh, quite a bit. That's why the air temperatures are going up so quickly. 17 of the 18 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been since 2001. The four hottest have been the last four years. Uh, last summer, Europe, uh, much of Europe was on a red alert, 44 degrees. Are y'all, how many here are Celsius? And ha how many here are Fahrenheit? Uh, it's mixed, half and half, all right. Well, I've got them both up here, 111 degrees Fahrenheit, 44 Celsius. In the southern hemisphere, summer just now ending 47.3 or 117 Fahrenheit in uh, Sydney. They had to close one of the roads because it melted. I've got about 100 videos of melting highways around the world. I'm not going to show them to you. Don't worry. Baghdad last summer broke its all-time record of 124 degrees Fahrenheit, 51 uh, Celsius, uh, so did uh, Kuwait City, and birds uh, fell dead out of the air from the heat exposure. The Emirates set its all-time record last summer, 51 and a half, 124.7 Fahrenheit. Uh, Iran, 128.7 Fahrenheit, 53.7 Celsius. Pakistan set its all-time record, also the all-time record for Asia, 129.2 last summer, Fahrenheit, 54 Celsius. And at the North Pole, let me just spend a moment on this because it's, it's, it's more important than a lot of people realize. February 25th, this is really the third year in a row this has happened, temperatures at the North Pole in winter, the sun's not even up yet, supposed to be frozen solid deep down, started thawing because it went above freezing in the middle of winter, 50 degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal, 28 uh, Celsius. Uh, now, this has consequences for patterns. The polar vortex split in half. You know, the whole globe is a, uh, the climate system is an engine for redistributing heat from the equator in the tropics to the poles through wind currents and ocean currents and multi-year systems like El Nino and some other lesser known ones. Uh, and when the Arctic heats up so much faster, than the rest of the world. Those patterns are subject to change. There were two studies two weeks ago, a peer-reviewed prestigious study showing that the long fear, long time fear that the Gulf Stream would slow down appears in the measurements to be happening. They're trying to interpret this. But I want to talk about air currents, the jet stream. This uh, polar vortex split in half. Uh, this is what it looks like on a normal, a normal pattern, you're looking down on the North Pole, that green circle in the middle is the polar vortex. Around it is a normal pattern for the jet stream. Uh, third week in February, this is what it looked like with these warm air currents direct, directly coming over the North Pole. Uh, and it pushed all, the cold air of the Arctic farther south. That's why you had these unseasonably winter conditions uh, in March and Ireland, all this snowed in Rome. Uh, but the daily mean temperature in the Arctic, of course, is cold, uh, colder, January 1, July 1, and then on the normal pattern. This is what it looks like this year. And, of course, the ice uh, in the Arctic is melting away very rapidly. It'll be ice-free maybe sooner than later in summer time. And this is the third year in a row this has happened. I went up to Greenland again last summer. One of the engineers on the helicopter we used took this video of the Jakobshavn glacier. It's literally exploding. This is in the middle of April. Uh, and again, way, this looks like a CGI 
movie, Eric, from a, a Transformer movie. It's not time lapse or CGI, it's real time. And this is basically why this octopus is in a parking garage in Miami Beach, Florida. And the low-lying coastal cities and areas around the world are now being routinely flooded by high tides and people are on the move. Now, on a global basis, you get away from the air temperature and the ice melting, 93% of all this extra heat energy is going into the ocean. And this has uh, tremendous consequences. It's building up 2,000 meters down. Half of this increase has been in the last 20 years. So warmer water, when these ocean-based storms come across the warmer water, they get much stronger and they have a lot more moisture. Harvey last summer crossed uh, the Gulf of Mexico when it was 7 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal for uh, Celsius. Uh, and it dropped uh, as much water as 509 days of the full flow of Niagara Falls on Texas and Louisiana, most of it in Harris County, Texas. And this was the fourth once in a thousand, this was once in a 25,000 year event, but it was the fourth once in a thousand year event in the last six years there. There are going to be many more of these uh, in the future. And in fact, we didn't have to wait very long because Irma uh, devastated the Caribbean uh, islands and Key West, and then Maria devastated Puerto Rico. And I'll just say to the Americans uh, here, uh, in my personal opinion, it's a disgrace that we have let down our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico. But my point is that, and I hope, Hope we can uh, fix that. Jim got his money for the World Bank. Maybe we'll put him in charge, ask him to <laughs> do this too. Uh, but you remember Superstorm Sandy in New York City. They poo-pooed the idea that the World Trade Center Memorial could flood, and then it did. That used to be a once-in-500-year event. It's now a once-in-25-year event. Between 17 and 28 years from now, that will be a once-in-five-year event. This is serious, folks. I mean, and the scale of it is just, it defies the moral imagination. We are breaking this system, the water cycle, the hydrological cycle, because when the oceans heat up, they also give a lot more water vapor up into the sky, and the warmer air holds more, so we get a lot more and a lot bigger atmospheric rivers now. This is Hawaii in the lower left and Silicon Valley in the upper right. That's an atmospheric river, 2,300 kilometers. The day this uh, satellite picture was taken, this is what Silicon Valley looked like, or at least San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley. This is an, a bigger atmospheric river just a few weeks ago that lines up with the events that I could also show you. We get rain bombs now, precipitation bombs, and it's also snow. You know, they've run out of adjectives or nouns like snowmageddon and snowpocalypse, uh, of course, it melts away in a few days, typically, but uh, we, the precipitation anomalies, these big downpours, they are now four times more common than they were in 1980, increased another 50% just in the last eight years. Yesterday in uh, Buenos Aires, they got a month's worth of rain in one day. Last fall, they had a hail bomb. One and a half meters, five feet of hail in 15 minutes. These people had to be rescued and taken to the hospital after freezing in their cars. Uh, yesterday, the capital of Bangladesh, most all of it was flooded. Three days ago, uh, 30,000 people displaced in Kenya. Four days ago in Martinique, 10 inches in six hours, five inches in one hour. Uh, earlier this month in Volga Volgograd, uh, a flood uh, emergency. Uh, two weeks ago, the all-time rainfall record in the United States of America was broken, almost 50 inches of rain in one day. This was uh, last month in Massachusetts and Kentucky. I could show you a lot of these. Queensland, 16 inches in 24 hours last month. Earlier this month in London and in York, 58 flood warnings. They've really uh, been under a siege here. But you know the saying, there'll always be in England, the pubs stayed open. <laughs> Last year, $320 billion in overall climate-related weather uh, disasters. Now, shifting gears, the same extra heat that puts all that water vapor into the 
atmosphere and causes the rain bombs and the floods, also pulls the moisture out of the soil and makes the droughts hit quicker and uh, deeper and last longer. The biggest uh, weather climate-related disaster this year is in Argentina right now. It's over $4 billion uh, now. Uh, the Vatican had to shut down its uh, fountains, and some of you know in um, the Western Cape, uh, the, the historic drought there may about to make uh, Cape Town the first major world city to completely run out of water. Zero day is now August 27th. Hopefully they'll get uh, some rain, but there are many other cities lined up behind Cape Town. We use more water when it gets hot, and there are other reasons, but We've got to deal with this. Elsewhere in Africa, there are four countries in Africa and the Middle East. The United Nations warned this week that 20 million people are on the verge of starvation. Uh, here in North America, and we naturally, those of us in the U.S., focus on the U.S., but please pay attention to Mexico and Central America. This is projected throughout the balance of this century, but it's already starting. This is this morning in the American Southwest, uh, exceptional drought in those darkest areas. And by the way, that panhandle of Oklahoma is exactly the epicenter of the Dust Bowl. Maybe that's a coincidence, but they have had less precipitation than during the Dust Bowl for the past year. In Colorado, one of their water experts testified two days ago, they're calling it the Millennium Drought in Colorado. 18 years they've been uh, in drought. Uh, and where there's drought, there's fire. It's already begun. This is an Oklahoma fire, almost 300,000 acres. This was yesterday in Arizona, 13 square miles. Uh, the fire season in the American West is 105 days per year longer than it was in the 1970s. Because when it gets hot, the not only the ground dries out, the vegetation does, and we have a lot more fires. This was the largest, uh, Mayor Garcetti was talking about this largest fire in the history of uh, California last year, the worst fire season uh, in history, Napa Valley. Uh, uh, I went up there and saw this after this uh, tragedy. This drone video goes on for a while. This was in the Columbia Gorge, and I show this just to remind you that it doesn't have to ruin your golf game. But we can't let this become the new normal. San Tropez, Portugal, two deadly fires uh, seasons last year, 400,000 hectares in Chile. Four days ago, firefighters died in Honduras with this massive fire. So shifting gears again. This has been a national security issue for uh, the Pentagon and others for quite a long time. I just want to mention the refugee crisis the climate-related drought in Syria underlay, it started before the Civil War, and the outpouring of refugees, other reasons as well, really uh, has destabilized some countries uh, in Europe, um, and some areas of North Africa and the Middle East may become literally uninhabitable, increasing flows of refugees. Even Brexit, the most powerful billboard in the Brexit campaign was this one, an endless line of refugees from the Middle East and North Africa. There, people aren't the only ones on the move. The average land-based animal and plant species moving 15 feet per day uh, toward the poles, we're at risk of losing half. So, must we change? Yes. The evidence is real clear. I haven't even mentioned o ocean acidification and some of these others. It is the biggest threat to the global economy. Mark Carney in England is one of many who points out that the vast majority of the carbon reserves are unburnable. That's one of the reasons why the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, whose income is 100% from oil and gas, just announced that it is divesting 100% from oil and gas. What do they know? Well, a lot of others are following their lead. We're at a turning point. We've got to change. Can we change? Here's the good news. A volatile climate is both an un unintended uh, a source of consequences, but it creates a new set of conditions for growth. We believe that the, uh, the products and services that are going to be most uh, desired are ones that enhance life today without borrowing resources from the future. 
And we're already seeing this in areas like energy, mobility, food, health. I'll touch on them briefly. Food, you, many of you are aware of the big shift toward alternative uh, proteins, uh, urban agriculture, precision agriculture, and the rest of these factors. Healthcare, genomic sequencing, microbiome sequencing, uh, digital health records, AI. Uh, these are exciting uh, opportunities. Uh, energy, I'm going to talk about uh, that one uh, a bit more. Uh, 18 years ago, the best projections for wind were 30 gigawatts by 2010. We beat that by 18 times over. It's an impressive exponential curve. It could supply 40 times all the energy the world needs. Solar is even more dramatic. 16 years ago, the projections were one gigawatt per year by 2010. Last year, we beat that seven, I mean, uh, 2010 came around, we beat it 17 times over. Last year, we beat that 98 times over. This exponential curve is even steeper, rising even more quickly because the cost is coming down so dramatically. The levelized cost, what it costs to produce, solar and wind is already the cheapest source. You put electricity markets in, it gets complicated in some regions. But all of these clean energy technologies have all been coming down dramatically in price. Uh, and this is pushing us across grid parity, which is the level below which unsubsidized solar is cheaper than coal. Uh, it's like the difference between zero degrees or one degree for, for the Fahrenheit folks here, 32 and 33. That's a difference of more than one degree. It's the difference between ice and water. And in markets, it's the difference between assets that are a capital that's locked up and free flows of investment seeking opportunities. Globally, since 2010, global investments in renewables have far exceeded that uh, in fossil, and the gap is growing. The projections in the near future are that it's going to continue growing. You put nuclear on top of it, it uh, the distance is even more. Now, there are political and economic forces trying to stop this. The world is subsidizing, forcing taxpayers to subsidize fossil fuels at a rate 38 times larger than the meager encouragements for renewables. And that's a political question. But it's not working. This is moving anyway. Last year in the U.S., uh, solar and wind made up for 62% of all new electricity generating capacity. You'll notice there's no coal here. Uh, by the way, the famous coal museum in Kentucky just put solar panels all over its roof. <laughs> if you look at China, they're still burning a lot of coal, but 54% of all their new generation is coming from renewables, and they're ramping it up very, very quickly. India, they did a U-turn after the Paris Agreement. 65% of their new capacity two years ago was from coal. Last year, 65%. Uh, from solar uh, and wind. Europe uh, has long been a leader. They're still burning too much coal and gas, but they're really uh, pointing the way. Some of you know the story of Chile. They went from 11 to 400 megawatts to 1.6 gigs. This is what's under construction now and approved for construction uh, to begin on the Atacama plain mostly. This is really quite a dramatic story. Michelle Bachelet, their immediate past president, deserves credit for this. It's not as well known. You, you multiply this scale by 10, and that's what's going on uh, in India. They have under construction now 175 gigawatts uh, of solar. This is happening, and it's really encouraging. And we get enough energy in one hour for the entire world economy's consumption for an entire year. So we're not going to run out of it, and it creates jobs. Solar installer jobs are growing nine times faster than other jobs in the U.S. economy. They're projected to be the fastest growing job uh, into the second half of the next decade. Second fastest is wind turbine technician. Uh, storage is increasing dramatically. The projections are even more dramatic. The biggest battery in the world was just installed in Australia. We've decoupled electricity sales from GDP, and this is happening all over the world. So transportation. Transportation is still a big nut to crack. It's now a larger source of CO2 in the U.S. than electricity generation. This is, you probably recognize this city, Eric. It was Thanksgiving Day. Uh, electric buses, mobility generally. Solar-powered electric vehicles, buses, scooters, cars, 
uh, autonomous, multimodal, on-demand, and shared. Half of the world's buses within seven years are going to be electric. Now, that statistic is dominated by Chinese electric buses in China, but this is happening all across uh, uh, the, the, the U.S. and all across uh, the world. In fact, a lot of countries are passing laws requiring a mandatory phase-out of the internal combustion engine. This, too, is very encouraging. General Motors has made this commitment. In the next model year, Volvo's not making any pure internal combustion engines. All of these manufacturers are shifting to electric vehicles, and the powertrain cost is about to cross over, and then that's going to supercharge uh, this switch. So all of these areas and more, energy mobility, food, health, uh, they add up to a sustainability revolution. Uh, and th this is powered by the new digital tools, the Internet of Things, machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's really quite a dramatic change. And to put it in the context of the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution and the digital revolution, the sustainability revolution has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. One quick example. Uh, this is giving executive teams the ability to manage electrons and atoms and molecules with the same precision the IT companies have used in managing bits of information. Google has the most, uh, the most server farms in the world. They asked DeepMind, their AI company, to try to manage their use of electrons and heat energy. No new hardware, increased output of processed information, a 56% decline in energy use just with AI managing the electrons much more uh, precisely. Uh, this revolution is meeting greater needs at greater speed and greater scale. It is the single largest investment opportunity uh, in all of history. Again, investing in the quality of life today without borrowing from the future. So, the answer to the second question, can we change, is yes, we have the tools, we have the solutions. We don't have to wait for some magical R&D breakthrough. We've got it right here. And many of the solutions that are cost effective today continue to come down in cost every month. We may be at one cent per kilowatt hour solar electricity by the end of this calendar year. It is astonishing. So final question, will we change? Well, you know that in the Paris Agreement, December 2015, every nation in the world agreed to get to net zero by mid-century. And I know what you're thinking, but <laughs> some of you might not know that in spite of President Trump's speech, the first day upon which the U.S. could legally withdraw from the Paris Agreement is the first day after the next presidential election. And if there... <laughs> and... If there is a new uh, president, excuse me for a moment, then a new president could simply give 30 days notice and we're right back uh, in the agreement. And in the meanwhile, the U.S. is on track to meet and exceed its commitments under the Paris Agreement regardless, and Eric talked a little bit about this, 16 states, including our biggest, uh, have taken the lead and they're, they're really accelerating uh, the progress. And Eric, I'm going to have to update. Well, these are all the cities committed to 100% renewable energy. These are the ones that have already reached it. And overall, uh, I think you've got a bigger number now than I have here. Is it 502 now? Uh, anyway, all these cities and states and colleges and 130 global companies have made a commitment to go 100% renewable. Investors and business leaders are moving faster than many governments. And by the way, India and China are both on track to way exceed the commitments that they made in the Paris Agreement. And the people are demanding it. This is, these are the 400,000 people marching on the eve of the UN uh, Special Summit. This was the one last April. That's the Treasury Building, and you see the White House behind it. Now, I worked in the White House for eight years, and I never thought I'd be marching on the White House, but there I am down in the <laughs> right corner with my daughter and granddaughter. So anyway, in closing... One of the greatest poets in the U.S. Uh, history, Wallace Stevens, was a businessman, became a poet, and he wrote these lines that after the last no, there comes a yes, and on that yes, the future world 
depends. Every great morally based revolution has encountered an endless string of no's until the underlying question was revealed to be a binary choice between what's clearly right and what's clearly wrong. We're on the cusp of that tipping point now. We're crossing it right now. And for anybody who doubts that we have the will to change, just remember that the will to change is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to part two of Miked Up with World Bank President Jim Yong Kim in conversation with Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, I'll say to them what I've said to you. It's a real honor for oh. you to come up and share the stage with me. Well, it's, uh, the honor is all mine. And let me just tell you, you know, um, when I became president of the World Bank Group, I thought I had been keeping up with uh, climate-related issues. I was a president of university. But um, you visited me like two weeks or three weeks into, into my presidency. And um, I was honored to meet with you. And, then, and instead of sharing niceties, you put, pulled your computer out and you took me through a very similar <laughs> presentation. And I have to tell you, it, it, it changed my life. And I, when, if you, how many people have seen the second version of Inconvenient Truth, right? So I think, I, I think that movie um, should win you another uh, Oscar. Well, actually, that, that time passed. But what I, <laughs> what I learned from it was that uh, the Vice President Gore had been going all over the world. And, you know, there was a scene in a barn, I think. You were in a barn, and you were taking people through the reality of climate change and uh, 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 changing their perspective on it completely. And that's exactly what you did for me. And you'll remember that in Copenhagen, um, the World Bank was not only in the room, not only not in the room, they weren't allowed on the premises, mm. right? So the World Bank was thought of as the enemy. And after that talk, uh, we started working. And so in that time, as you know, we committed to putting 28% of all our resources into climate change. And so now with the new resources, um, that'll be a total of about $30 billion a year um, by 2020 or so, right? Wow. And so, so that's a difference. <clears throat> but, you know, it wasn't an applause line because the point I wanted to make is that's nowhere near enough. You yeah. know that, right? So we have been talking about uh, the six major uh, countries that are putting more and more coal-fired power online, which is China, India, uh, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, Pakistan, and Indonesia. And they still say that the biggest problem is cost of capital. Mm. So what do we do about it? This, yeah. you know, we, I think Mike was saying that there's 45 trillion under management in, uh, you know, at this Milken meeting. So how, how, do we, how do we change things so that so those investments start happening, that we yeah. lower the cost of capital, that we let everyone th see that uh, using your capital to tackle this problem is maybe the most important thing we can do? Yeah, well, you're compiling an amazing record, Jim, and, and, and thank you again. And in answer to your question, of course, we need policy. We need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels at the horrific rate that's still underway. And uh, by the way, well, I won't get into the particulars there. But even without um, the policy changes, uh, taking a a real long-term view, the way the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund has, the way some of the institutions uh, uh, present here have done, is really uh, the, the key to this. Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, in the last 20 years, I think maybe a majority of the Nobel Prizes in economics have gone to people who in one way or the other are teaching us that we're not rational, uh, uh, accounting machines uh, uh, with perfect information available to us. Uh, behavioral economics is quite significant. And we have this uh, cultural focus on short-term performance in, in a way that really distorts uh, rational allocation of capital. Uh, and uh, one famous study a few years ago by BNA asked uh, CEOs and CFOs, a lot of them, a whole bunch of questions. One of the questions was a hypothetical. Here is an expenditure you can make for your company that meets all of your internal 
uh, IRR standards. It's going to make your company stronger, better positioned to compete in the future. Uh, everything's right about it except for one thing. If you make this investment, you will slightly miss your next quarterly estimate. Under those uh, conditions, will you make the investment? 80% said no. And maybe it's changed uh, since that study was made, but it hadn't changed that much. Mm. And I think where uh, global capital allocation decisions are concerned, there is this same uh, obsession with the, you know, the next election, the next quarterly report, overnight ratings. Uh, and, and we have to, to find ways uh, to reform uh, the way we measure the spectrum of value to really make intelligent, rational mm -hmm. decisions. So, uh, you know, it, what, one of the things that is um, always on, um, on people's minds here is the difference between ESG concerns, environment, yeah. social governance concerns, and fiduciary responsibility. And there are some, uh, you know, I just met um, today with Hiro Mizuno, who's trying to say, you know, he, he's, the way he's now saying it is GPIF, the, the, the you know, $1.4 trillion you know, Japanese government pension fund, he now th sees himself as a universal owner. In other words, you have to be concerned about the outcomes for the entire world over a long period of time. And yeah. when you do that, you have to change the way that, that you behave. Yeah. But he's finding it difficult uh, to change the way his, uh, uh, you know, his actual traders and asset allocators behave yeah. because still they have to be concerned with beating the market in the short term. So I have to tell you, I hear a lot of talk about uh, impact investing. You know, we hear a lot of talk about green bonds and how much the green bond market has grown. But when I look at the problem of, prov of providing capital so that uh, the transformations to clean energy can be made, and especially when I look at the investments we need to make in adaptation, because mm -hmm. you, you know that the Africa countries signed on because mm -hmm. promises were made that we would make massive investments in adaptation for those countries, I just don't see it. Mm. I, I see a lot of talk mm. about ESG and impact investing, but I don't see the actual money moving. Can you tell me a different story? How, yeah, I think how, it's, I, how I can think we it's, make it move? I think it's beginning to shift. Uh, first of all, I wanted to follow on your comment about Hiro Mizuno. He happens to be a very close personal friend, and I think he's probably he's here, somewhere, uh, right? here today. Uh, but, but his uh, pension fund's the largest in the world, and they're, they're, they're making progress. A lot, a lot of them are. But I wanted to circle back to your first comment about the relationship uh, between ESG and fiduciary right. responsibility, because that is really where dramatic change is underway. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be commonplace back in the days of so-called ethical investing and negative screen investing um, that people would say, well, that sounds nice, but I have fiduciary responsibility and I, I, I have to... And generally the returns were not very good. Well, that's, there, was also the, right? there was also that issue, but now there's a new, a new model of full integration of uh, ESG, full integration of sustainability that uh, is producing uh, really, really uh, welcome returns and people are taking notice of this. Um, and there is now voluminous academic research showing that if you do not take ESG into account, you are almost certainly violating your fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. So this is being flipped on its head. There are a number of studies. The biggest was the Oxford Arabesque study. Harvard Business School has mm -hmm. done fantastic work. Uh, generation uh, investment management. We, ha we have a list of all these studies. We've helped to finance some of them through our foundation. But this is really changing quite uh, significantly. And by the way, the UK government is in the, the midst right now of rewriting its regulations to mandate that fiduciary res that ESG be included as part of fiduciary responsibility. Now, some people have looked at um, ESG as maybe a, a risk mitigation tool, and it certainly is that. But one of the points that I wanted to make in this presentation and in our talk here is that the opportunity recognition function is equally important. We are in a transition, uh, and we're going, we're going from one era to another. And focusing on ESG is, is a, an invaluable tool in recognizing the exciting new opportunities that are more likely than not to have higher returns than average. And one other point, 
there have been studies of industry sectors, and in the vast majority of them, I think it's 17 out of 28 uh, companies that take ESG into account in their management are outperforming their peers in those market mm -hmm. sectors. I'm proud to be on the board of Apple. It's the largest, most profitable company in the history of the world. Apple just became 100% renewable energy powered uh, three weeks ago, and I can tell you, is obsessed with uh, ESG and all its dimensions. It is not inconsistent uh, with uh, high profits and uh, good returns for all of the shareholders and all the stakeholders. So uh, there are these investments, uh, you know, that, that can be very profitable, but it would be so helpful if we could establish a price on carbon. I know there's a lot yeah, of progress. Yeah. Where are we on this? You know, as you know, we, we host the, um, the, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Yeah. And again, there's a lot of interest, a lot of talk. There's California has done uh, uh, great stuff, but where do you see this going? When will we, is there a chance for us to have a global price on carbon? Well, there's a difference between a direct price and an indirect price. And I favor both, uh, you won't be surprised to hear. Uh, and I introduced uh, legislation establishing a price on carbon 30 years ago and succeeded in getting a carbon tax. We called it a BTU tax. Uh, uh, the camouflage didn't entirely work, but in, uh, in January uh, of uh, 1993, the Clinton-Gore administration's first budget plan to the Congress included a carbon tax, and it passed the House of Representatives by one vote, uh, more than one, uh, and then f failed in the Senate by a very narrow margin. And th that, then um, um, that became a, a political uh, lesson that made some people think, okay, I don't want to go there. And in many countries around the world, countries have chosen the alternative of an indirect tax in the, f not a tax, but an indirect uh, charge uh, 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 in the form of cap and, and trade. Uh, China just implemented it in ja starting in January, as you know. Uh, the European Union, the state of California, many other U.S. states, uh, quite a few countries around the world. Uh, and it is uh, having some impact, uh, but the political resistance to a straight-up carbon tax is still very, very strong. There are some very prominent Republicans, uh, former Secretary of State George Shultz, former Secretary of State Jim Baker, and some <laughs> others who have openly advocated this. And uh, there, there are a few uh, changes among Republicans in the Congress, not enough. Um, so maybe uh, we'll get there. But for now, I think that it is uh, more fruitful to push on a cap-and-trade uh, system and I think that I think we are likely to get a global cap and trade regime. Uh, you know, under the rules of the WTO, a, a, a direct or indirect fee on carbon is treated like a value added tax, mm -hmm. uh, refundable at the border, charged against countries that don't have a like fee. Uh, and if you get the European Union and China uh, and others linked up with this, then uh, it's not long before the pressure in the trading system will cause other nations to have to do it. Mm. Uh, is there, uh, the, you, the, you've showed us so many of these dramatic events, right? Um, and the thing that, that um, was striking to me is that, you know, even weather forecasters will talk about one in a thousand year events yeah. multiple, multiple, multiple times. Yeah. And it seems like, uh, you know, they're, they're surprised and, and uh, fascinated every single time. Yeah. What, what's gonna, when is this going to change? Yeah, yeah, when we, are we going to add it all, add it all up? Because I have to tell you, I'm just terrified. You know, yeah. when, I see, when I see what's happening in the developing countries, I mean, yeah. the developing countries, um, the, the chance of the kind of uh, conflict that we saw in Syria, right? yeah. there are many countries in Africa yeah. that I think are sort of pre-fragility conflict violence, yeah, yeah. extremism, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, with, with climate. So how, you know, I, we're, we're killing ourselves trying to think, is, you know, what can we do to de-risk entire countries, to put, use every single one of our tools, political risk insurance, partial risk guarantees, to attract more investment? But in, in this audience, what I still hear is that, well, those investments are too risky. They're not, they're, not, they're not areas that we feel comfortable in. 
But the, the risk really is what you've talked about. What's going to happen if we don't make these investments, especially in things related to mitigation and adaptation of climate change? Yeah, we've had in the U.S. 14 once-in-a-thousand-year events in the last seven years. Now, they're not supposed to come around every six months if they're a once-in-a-thousand-year event. And the same is true uh, all over the world. And I, I think this is uh, getting the attention of people, even people who are not comfortable using a phrase like global warming or climate crisis. It's like Groundhog Day, the movie, right? It's yeah, like a every little time, bit. Yeah, it's it, just, the yeah. fascination all over again, you know, the, with, the, with the, the same... Phenomenon. Every night on the television news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelations. I mean, and, and, <laughs> and the newscasters uh, frequently don't connect up the dots, but people are doing it on their own, and, and I truly believe that, that things are uh, beginning to change. Uh, Seventy percent of the American people are in favor of a big change. But now, uh, just a, a brief excursion into political science. And those from other countries, forgive me um, when I say as a citizen of the U.S. that I still believe that the U.S. is the natural leader in the community of nations. And um, you could make an argument that others might be able to take its place, but I don't see it in the near term. Uh, and... The, that natural leader in the community of nations has been sidelined on the climate issue. A, a minority uh, of opinion now has been in control of our policies. And, you know, we're the only country in the world that has this persistently high level of, of uh, climate uh, denial. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in Tennessee where I live, the farmers have a saying that if you see a a turtle on top of a fence post, you can be pretty sure it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> um, and similarly, uh, this didn't happen by itself. And there are now major lawsuits uh, filed by New York and uh, Massachusetts, lots of other states, lots of cities uh, uh, are, are filing lawsuits uh, on this. And uh, I, I think they're going to be held accountable. Uh, some of not all, but a great many of the largest carbon polluters in this country, took the playbook of the tobacco industry. And you know this story as a physician. Uh, after the Surgeon General's report linked cigarettes with lung and heart diseases, they hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them in front of cameras with teleprompters to falsely reassure people that there was no problem. Uh, and 100 million people died uh, as the appropriate regulations mm -hmm. were delayed 40 years. Mm -hmm. So they have done exactly the same thing, hired many of the same PR firms. It is deeply immoral and unethical. And at some point, there will be an accounting. But for the time being, we have to overcome this resistance. And uh, again, for those of you in the, here in the US, I hope you're registered to vote. Uh, I don't care what party you're in. Uh, I, I just think that uh, ultimately this is going to come down in part to a question of political power. We have, we have to solve this. We have the tools. We have momentum. As your questions point out, not enough momentum for sure. But from the, when, when I first started working on this 40 years ago, Jim, the, the central reality was that the maximum that's politically feasible still fell far short of the minimum to satisfy the laws of physics. And we're still in that situation, but the gap has narrowed, and we're gaining on the problem. It's still running ahead of us, but we're gaining on it. And by the way, there's a generational change, too. These young people, if they're business, business leaders who are in the hiring market, you know you can't hire the best and brightest coming out of universities and colleges now uh, unless they feel like they're not only going to make good money, but they're going to work for a firm that shares their value so they can tell their friends and family they're helping make the world a better place. Mm. Uh, you look at those uh, Parkland, Florida high school kids sure. and the gun issue. This generation is really bringing uh, some significant mm. potential for change. And so I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. We can win this. We're going to win this. The only question is we got to win it faster than we're winning Excellent. it now. Uh, let me ask you just a specific question. One of the things that we're, we're, we're looking at is you know, the, the highest, uh, the largest amount of sunlight that falls on a continent falls in, in Africa. Uh, what's, the, what's holding us back from, say, making 
uh, large parts of Africa massive uh, exporters of electricity uh, from solar energy. Should be. And is that, that, that's, a, that's probably not a transmission. It's probably a storage issue, right? Because we, we, it may be difficult to send transmission lines all the way into, um, into Europe. But the storage, you know, I just, I just uh, met with Patrick Sunshong today who told me that he's going to crack the $100 a kilowatt hour uh, barrier with the zinc system. Right? Yeah. Now, that would really change the ballgame, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's already cheaper in Africa to make electricity from the sun than to make it by burning fossil fuels. I don't think it's primarily a storage issue. Mm. Storage will help, uh, and storage is coming down in cost also. Uh, I think it's primarily a political issue and a leadership okay. issue. And the same kind of legacy uh, influence uh, of fossil fuel companies that we have in the U.S. is present in so many countries in Africa. Many of the cities in South Africa get a major portion of their budget from INSCOM. Uh, from the from the uh, electricity provider, yes. no, it will. Uh, you you you, ha <laughs> you know all about this, and so, uh, but but look, you know, I often draw an analogy. I didn't do it today, um, between this uh, transition and what happened with uh, telephone yeah. service, and y you go to Kenya today, uh, you can see Maasai warriors with their traditional robes reach in, do their banking on a, yeah, on absolutely. a cell phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, I think. Literally every person in Africa has a cell phone now, and and uh, that's an exaggeration, but not much of one. Almost. It's really oh. incredible. <coughs> and one reason that transition took place so quickly is they did not have landline telephone grids. Well, they don't have landline electricity grids, and to get the the trees and the copper and the coal and uh, build all that when when there's m a much better and cheaper source of power there. That's why. In East Africa, in West Africa, now it's beginning in the southern cone. We're seeing a very rapid build-out of, uh, of solar. Uh, so I, I am optimistic. But yes, they could export. And in northern Africa, Morocco is an example of a country. I could have showed you slides like the Chile and India slides with Morocco. They're planning, you know, there's this massive plan to ship renewable electricity uh, across the Mediterranean, three different routes to, to sell to... Europe, and they can ship it south uh, uh, below the Sahel, uh, uh, Sahara and the Sahel to the rest of Africa as well. But and the reason I asked you about the storage question is that, that uh, you know, if, if, if we can break the, the $100 per kilowatt hour I mean, and, and even, even lower than that, it could be that you could charge with the batteries in Africa and then ship them all over the world. That, that's what our teams are looking at. What do, you, what do you think about that idea? I wouldn't have thought of that. Uh, uh, and they, they're telling us, so I always tell the story, you know, we, 25 years ago at the World Bank, we had a heated debate about whether we should invest in telephone poles in India. Right? Now, luckily, we decided not to, and that was a smart thing. Yeah. But then I, what I keep asking is, are we doing the equivalent of investing in telephone poles in India? And we're having a heated debate about this right now in terms of, you know, alter, uh, is, uh, you know, is uh, um, uh, natural gas a transition fuel, and should we still be doing anything in that? We've stopped our upstream, as you know, yeah. but should we do, be doing anything at all? And uh, the, the, the issue seems to be still, you know, solar and wind is intermittent. Uh, it, doesn't battery power change this for us? Battery power does change that it. A lot, of batteries, a lot of the batteries installed also empower fossil fuel uh, energy. We True, need yeah. to have a, a policy uh, that, that really allocates them toward the renewables, but let me uh, take hold of your natural gas question because I've changed on that over the last several years. I did think that it uh, had a useful purpose uh, as a transition fuel, and to some extent it has played that role. However, um, it, you know, it only emits 50% of the CO2 when burned that, that coal does, two-thirds of the CO2 that oil emits when burned. And some people say, well, that's glass half full, glass half empty. No. The, it's poured into an atmosphere that's already completely full. Right. Uh, and here's the main thing, and the new studies underscore this concern. Each molecule of methane, natural gas is basically methane, 99%. Uh, each molecule of methane uh, that goes into the atmosphere traps 84 times as much energy as a molecule of CO2. That's over a 20-year period. The math gets 
complicated after that, but it's a big multiple on out past a century and more. Uh, and that means that if you have two or three percent of it leaking from the fracking process, from the compression of the gas, from the pipelining of the gas, uh, then it completely negates any advantage over coal. And the studies now indicate, the ones that are not financed by the industry, indicate that there is a real reason for concern that exactly that is happening. Second final concern here. There is now, you talk about capital allocation, there is an enormous amount of uh, capital now being allocated to build out a massive extension of the gas pipeline networks all across America, in some cases charging present day uh, users to help amortize the cost. And if we allocate that much into fos new fossil fuel infrastructure, then that takes away from what we need to allocate to speeding up this transition to carbon free renewables. We need to go carbon free. Yeah. Well, I wanted to thank you. And, you know, I told this story once that. Uh, 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 and, and uh, you, you know, the reason I'm so focused on climate change is because someday, and based on the way my children, my two sons already talked to me, they're going to say, Dad, you were president of the World Bank. Why didn't you do more to fight climate change? Yep. Now, my nine-year-old actually saw that on video once, and so he now regularly says exactly that. To me, right? <laughs> we'll see a story. We'll see one of the flooding stories. They know how to me, get to you. And he'll say, they? Dad, why aren't you doing more? But here's what I always say. I say, well, look, um, I'm trying to do as much as I can, and every day I think about what would Al Gore tell me to do about climate change on this uh -huh. day. And that's why we're going to get there. Thank you very much, Thank you. Jim. Thank you. Thank you.